Hey everyone, Chief Meteorologist Tom Miners here from WBBJ 7 Eyewitness News with some weather lessons for you. I know with everything that's going on, things seem a little bit out of the ordinary lately, so hopefully you can take this weather lesson to enjoy with your kids or kids if you're watching, uh, even some of your friends and just share that with them, but also of course teachers and hopefully I will be talking more about weather, astronomy, even just biology and some more lessons upcoming over the spring and possibly even into the summer months. So let's take a look at some science. All right, so what we're gonna end up doing today is talking a little bit about meteorology, which means the study of the weather and climate. And we're gonna take a look at some lessons, including what you already know. So some of this is gonna be review and some of this is hopefully gonna be some new information for you. We got this photograph not too long ago from Savannah, Tennessee, from a viewer uh, who shared this with me on Facebook. And I'm just kind of curious about what you're seeing here. You know, in this picture, kind of looks like something you might recognize. So how do you think that these clouds came to look like this? It basically might have to do with something you already know a lot about. You know, these clouds came to looking like waves because of the wind. Of course, they form in a very similar way that the wind does, or at least the waves do, which is from those winds which blow around, along the top of the ocean. And so in this video here, of course, you see waves crashing on a beach, and those clouds came to form the same way. Really strong winds in the top part of the clouds and not as strong winds in the bottom part of the cloud. A lot of what you know already about weather came from you just watching it and just observing it. We have four seasons, right? You might consider a fifth season, which would be, any guesses? Maybe hurricane season, or you can even say it's the sixth where there's severe weather season, but we can have severe weather every time of the year. Now we've got four seasons. You've got summer, fall, winter, and spring. But do you know why we have four seasons? It's an important question because there are parts of the globe that have very different forms of those four seasons. Now, you might be already giving the answer, but of course this has all to do with the angle of the sun. If you look up at the sun in the middle of the day, right around summertime, you'd actually see that the sun is straight up in the sky. And then when you start to look at the sun in the wintertime, say even around Thanksgiving or Christmas, later on in the year, closer to the first day of winter, that sun in the even highest part of the day is only at a very shallow angle on the horizon. So as the Earth is rotating, it's rotating on its axis. And that means that the Earth is actually going to have the North Pole tilted toward or away from the Sun, the South Pole toward or away from the Sun. So the South Pole is getting light all day on December 21st. But on December 21st in the Northern Hemisphere, on the North Pole, it's actually dark all day. And that angle of the sunlight is the reason why we have seasons. Did you actually know that the Earth and its distance to Sun has no impact whatsoever on our seasons? Even though the Earth has its orbit around the sun, there's actually a time of the year when the Earth is closest to the sun in its orbit. Now the difference isn't noticeable, but it's actually closest to the sun in the month of January, and it's farthest away from the sun in the month of July, believe it or not. So it's just that angle of the tilt of the axis. Now can you see this tilt from the Earth? Well, you can basically deduce it, or you can basically make a conclusion that the Earth is tilted just based on what I showed you earlier, how the tilt or the angle of the sun in the sky changes throughout the year. But in Alaska, in northern Alaska, and parts of the northern hemisphere near the Arctic Circle, very close to the North Pole, they have darkness for two whole months. The sun never rises. And this tweet was sent out uh, back in January, January 23rd. They had the first sunrise in the northernmost part of the United States, in northern Alaska, in 68 days and the sun rose at that afternoon at one o'clock in the afternoon so we have 68 66 days of darkness in the middle of winter no sunrise no sunset just straight nighttime the whole time for about two whole months in the winter time and near the north pole but then the opposite happens in the summertime you see because then the north pole is tilted toward the sun during the summer months so the sun never sets and there's two whole months of sunlight and that happens from about late May into late July. Now let's talk about the water cycle. Now this is a really important and fascinating part of really how all weather comes to be. 
tiny droplets of air that we can't even see in my office here are floating around and eventually going to become raindrops. And it takes a million of them, these tiny little droplets we call water vapor, to just make one whole raindrop. So that's evaporating right now. And eventually when they go up high and up into the sky, uh, they will start to condense and form those bigger droplets and eventually collect into even bigger droplets and then falls raindrops or maybe something else, some form of precipitation. When that rain or any form of precipitation, sleet, hail, snow, reaches the ground, runs off back, in, back into the lakes, oceans, rivers, streams, creeks, you name it. But because our weather in West Tennessee can be quite variable, we don't always get just rain and we don't always get just snow. Sometimes we get a mix and uh, we often find ourselves dealing with freezing rain or sleet. But the biggest important part of making a forecast for ice is knowing how thick is the atmosphere in the warm air layer and then how thick is it in the cold air layer. And uh, we use a lot of different tools to determine uh, those two parts of the forecast. But if the air is colder than 32 degrees or colder than freezing, then you will get snow if it's that way throughout the entire atmosphere above your head. And if it's, of course, all warmer than 32 degrees, then you only get rain. We use objects like this. This is called a skew T diagram. And that word is not really important. But basically, you can see on the um, map here, what we've got is we've got a red line and a green line. And then a bunch of little feathery looking lines here. Uh, these basically tell you the temperature in the air above your head, the dew point, which is how much moisture there is uh, above your head, and also uh, the wind speed and direction among many other important attributes of the atmosphere. Uh, that helps to determine what kind of clouds you'll even see and where in the atmosphere they will form, like this cloud. Do you know what kind of cloud this is? This is called a cirrus cloud and it forms so high up in the air that it's actually made of ice crystals, not of liquid drops of water. So sometimes if you see a cirrus cloud come in between you and the sun, then you'll end up seeing a ring form around the sun. Now these are called stratus clouds and typically they will develop and form very low to the ground. So not as high as the cirrus clouds and usually they'll cover the whole sky. So on a day when you can't see any sunlight, usually what you're looking at is a stratus cloud. These are called cumulus clouds. They usually form on hot and sunny days, but they can become a little bit more than cumulus clouds if the conditions are right. Sometimes they become cumulonimbus clouds, and that's a thunderstorm. This is where we have a lot more happening inside the cloud than just rain. This is when we have really strong gusts of wind blowing up inside the clouds so that they become thunderstorms and maybe even produce tornadoes or severe weather. But they have wind blowing up, wind blowing down, wind blowing side to side. So this is a very, uh, I guess you could say, um, important part of also predicting the weather is knowing the wind that's blowing inside those clouds. Take this time-lapse video that we uh, captured from the Discovery Park of America in Union City. You can clearly see in the very beginning of the video that there's a really strong gust of wind blowing up inside that cloud. That's called an updraft and that's what leads to a thunderstorm, but it can even lead to more than just a thunderstorm. In this next experiment, we're going to find out how hail forms. Pretend this squeaky ball is a raindrop. Raindrops will get caught by strong gusts of wind, which we're going to pretend is coming from this leaf blower. Well, it is actually going to blow very strong wind, so we'll see what happens when a raindrop gets met with the wind from a thunderstorm. Are you ready? Now, sometimes those winds blow very strong so that the raindrops, or in this case, a hailstone, flies very high up into the sky. Eventually, those raindrops freeze when they get up really high into the atmosphere and fall back to the ground as hailstones, sometimes even as big as this squeaky toy. 
So in the same way that we get hail, we also get lots and lots of lightning. Lightning, of course, a very dangerous part of weather. Lightning is hotter than the surface of the sun and can reach temperatures around 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Lightning happens all over West Tennessee, all over the country, but especially along the Gulf Coast for people who live near Louisiana, Southern Mississippi, Alabama, Florida. Florida is really one of the lightning capitals there, the country. Um, we can even see a lot of lightning, but not as much as they do there closer to the ocean. Lightning happens when you get that updraft, that strong gust of wind inside the cloud, and that'll cause these tiny particles called electrons to have different charges. Some are positively charged, some are negatively charged, and when those two opposites get far apart from each other, then there will be something that tries to balance them out, a lightning strike happening within a millionth of a second. Um, so we have lots of different kinds of lightning, or at least ways that lightning happens. Some lightning happens from the cloud to the ground. Some lightning happens within the cloud, and some lightning happens between two clouds. Now, people like to refer to lightning that doesn't produce thunder that you can hear as heat lightning. But the fact is that all lightning produces thunder. And thunder is the sound you hear when that lightning strike that's 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit ends up heating the air and doing it so quickly that the air expands. And that's what you're hearing is the expansion of that air around the lightning bolt. Now, we also should talk about high pressure and low pressure. High pressure and low pressure also different parts of our weather that help us understand what's about to happen. Low pressure has winds that blow in a counterclockwise direction and high pressure has winds that blow in a clockwise direction and away from the center of high pressure. But more than that, high and low pressure also cause air to rise or sink. High pressure causes the air to sink and low pressure causes the air to rise. So you need rising air in order to get evaporation and condensation going. So we actually see more clouds on days with low pressure and fewer clouds on days with high pressure. But I don't think it's good for me to just tell you that. Let me prove it to you. Now this first experiment has to do all with the water cycle. We're going to take a look at a cloud inside this bottle. Now there's no cloud in there right now, of course, but we're going to change the air pressure. We measure pressure with something called a barometer. And the barometer literally tells you about how much air there is above our heads. You know, if you go down in a swimming pool underwater, there's a point at which your ears start to feel kind of funny. So the same thing happens with air. The barometer is made up of a tiny spring, which will expand and constrict depending on how much air there is outside. Some days we have high pressure, and some days we have low pressure. So we're gonna change the air pressure inside this bottle with this air pump. Let's see what happens when we create high pressure by putting in 10 pumps of air. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Not too much, right? Days with high pressure in our weather forecast usually will appear sunny. But then when the pressure drops, we see a change. On the count of three, we'll let all the air rush out and see what happens. One, two, three. Woo! And there you have it, a cloud in a bottle. Might be a little bit difficult to see, so let's see if we can change this experiment to make a bottle show a bigger cloud. This time, we've got a little bit of water on the inside of the bottle. Let's see what happens this time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Hmm, maybe a little bit of a thicker cloud this time. You might have already noticed that there's a little bit of food coloring also on the inside of the bottle to show you the water. Let's put a little bit more in and see what happens. All right. Now, by putting that food coloring in, do you think that could possibly make the cloud turn purple? Hmm. Let's go ahead and see what happens when we put air in this time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
nine, ten. All right, here we go. Do you think the cloud will be purple or gray or maybe something else? Let's find out. One, two, three. Still just a gray cloud. The water inside was able to condense or even evaporate, but the purple food coloring stays inside because if the cloud was purple, that would mean that anything could evaporate. Orange juice, soda, even hot chocolate, but only water can go through the water cycle. Now I use a lot of different weather instruments to see what the weather is doing. Some help me make predictions like the barometer which you saw measures air pressure, but this one is called the anemometer and it measures how fast the wind is blowing and it can also tell me how strong the gusts are, which is when you have a short burst of very strong winds. Some weather instruments also help us stay weather aware or help tell us about severe weather like this weather radio. Days 2 through 7, Saturday through Thursday, strong to severe storms are possible across plains of mid-south on Saturday. Now that is a forecast from the NOAA weather radio, which you can listen to at any point you want if you have a weather radio. They're pretty cheap to pick up for the most part, and they're also equipped to give you warnings and watches if severe weather is coming well in advance. So weather radios can be a very helpful way to be warned about severe weather. So a quick few lessons now as we wrap up about broadcast meteorology. There's our TV station in East Jackson. Being a broadcast meteorologist or a weathercaster has a lot of responsibility and it means being responsible for being ready to talk about severe weather when it's happening, whenever it's happening, whether it's happening on Christmas Eve or uh, the morning of a Sunday. Uh, we have to be ready to go in the Storm Team Weather Center. So we have four meteorologists, all who share those responsibilities, Brian Davis, myself, Corrales Ortiz, and Mo Chamel. Each one of us takes a shift as Mo and I work on the weekdays and Brian and Corrales work on the weekends. And we all split during the morning or evening. I see uh, Mo, of course, in the morning and then you can see me in the evening hours. Our weather center has 11 different computer monitors. It's a lot, but each one of them has a very important job to play. And we spend a lot of our time in the studio, at least on that right side of the picture, on the green screen. That's where you see us on TV most often. And that is where I will basically look to TV monitors, one that is to my right and one that's to my left, and there's also one in front of me too. And those monitors help me see what I'm trying to point to on the screen. So very helpful and it takes a lot of practice to get used to trying to point to something that you can't see directly behind you. Of course, we spend a lot of time in severe weather coverage and we have to talk about tornadoes quite often in West Tennessee. We have tornado watches and warnings. Tornado watches are issued for a large area, but not to necessarily tell you where exactly a tornado might be happening. They tell you to simply watch and be prepared and be ready for a possible tornado. But when a tornado warning is issued, that means that a tornado probably could be happening right then. It means that something called radar has detected and seen where a tornado or a thunderstorm is rotating uh, or somebody themselves with their own eyes has spotted a tornado. Uh, so that's when the threat is much more imminent and you need to take action and get to shelter right away. Here's a look at tornadoes and how they form in West Tennessee. For this last experiment, we're gonna see how a tornado forms. Tornadoes take lots of ingredients in order to come together. So if we take these two soda bottles, one that's filled with water and one that's empty, we actually have to see the air spin in order for our tornado to form. You can see once the water starts spinning inside this bottle that we actually have a tornado develop, or what looks like a tornado at least. Now most tornadoes in West Tennessee don't look like this. They're completely wrapped with rain, so they're very difficult to see, and most also happen at nighttime. But most usually last about this long, sometimes seconds, maybe some for a few minutes. So, do you know where in your house you should be going if a tornado happens? Well, I'm curious as to how many of you have a room underneath the house, maybe a storm shelter, or in this case, a basement. Very important room, of course. Being underground is the safest place to be during a tornado, but how many of you have a bathroom at home? 
probably all of you, this bathroom would be the safest place to go in during a tornado simply because it's in the center of the home. You want to be in the very middle of the house and as far away from any of these exterior walls as possible. You want to make sure that you have as many walls between you on the outside of the house as possible and you also want to be on the very lowest floor of the home. The worst place to be would be near windows. You can be, of course, uh, near a window to see outside, but you're also very close to flying debris, which is one of the most dangerous parts of a tornado is the debris that it picks up and throws around. The safest place to be would be near a basement. We did some severe weather coverage two days before Christmas uh, about five years ago. Tornado, though, in uh, parts of Mississippi here. That's uh, Marshall County, I believe, correct? That should be just... Uh, it's in Tipper County now. Oh, that's in Tipper County now? Okay. That was kind of a scary day because we actually not only had confirmation of a tornado on the ground doing damage in Mississippi heading toward West Tennessee, but we also saw how strong it was and the damage that it had been causing when it was moving through Mississippi. That was the day when meteorologist Eddie Holmes and I were on air talking about that tornado, which ended up being an EF4 tornado with over 200 mile per hour winds. Now, this is a picture of what it left behind just to show you some of the damage that that storm caused. Now, when I was a child, I actually finally remember reading a book about three pigs and a wolf. And I think what's important to know from that story is that while the wolf, wolf did blow stronger and stronger on uh, the um, houses, he only was able to knock down the straw or the uh, stick houses, but not the brick one. And yet in this picture, you see bricks lying flat and, well, sticks still standing. That's because this house has interior walls. Even as thin and as flimsy as they might be, these brick walls are forced over by the strong winds on the outside of the house, and they're not able to knock down the interior house walls. They're much more structurally sound. So if a person was in this house, and we hope they were not, then they would have been safer in the hallway than in the living room or in the kitchen. We don't even know if that oven was from that house. It could have been from a different home. But tornadoes happen any time of the year, although they are mostly common in April and May, two months we're about to enter, and tornadoes happen all over the country. They can happen in any state, although we find ourselves in an area that does frequently deal with tornadoes. So this severe weather season, as you take some of these lessons to heart, learning about clouds and learning about high and low pressure and learning about how hail forms. Just remember to use your eyes and ears to focus on what the weather is doing. Maybe even make your own seven day forecast while you're gonna be out of school here for the next few weeks. It might be fun for you to try and see how the weather can be predicted just by using your eyes or using a tool to measure the pressure, the barometer. Also make sure to tune in to watch WBBJ 7 Eyewitness News to see how well we do with predicting the weather. If you have any messages you want to send or questions, feel free to contact me through social media or even an email or a phone call. You can always call the station to reach me at 731-424-4515. Hope this video has been very interesting for you. I hope I also have a chance to make some more, maybe another one or two as we go into the spring and summer months ahead. As I know, I'm sure most of you miss school quite a bit right now. Uh, so make sure to tune in to WBBJ and stay weather aware.